like that. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the Hub for the Brown Bears. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to give you our uh, coming attractions. So uh, next week, uh, our own Sarah Burghardt is going to be talking about social inequality and infant mortality in China and India. And then the week after, on the 22nd, that's uh, our own Mel Steffen is going to be talking about voter turnout and the labor market. Uh, today I'm pleased to introduce uh, Kate Cagney, who is Associate Professor of Health Services Research at the University of Chicago and also a faculty associate of the Department of Comparative Human Development and Department of Sociology at Chicago and is the director of the Chicago Population Research Center. Uh, she's visiting this term uh, at ISR, or this, this term in Chicago, in the winter quarter of Chicago. Um, is here for a few more weeks. Uh, her research interests are in uh, neighborhood effects and health, race and ethnic differences in access to health care and long-term care, uh, and the, the demography of aging, particularly the role of family structure in long-term care arrangements. And um, she has quite an accomplished publication record, over uh, 25 publications, uh, most of which are in leading journals in gerontology, public health, uh, sociology, and medicine. So please join me in uh, welcoming me. No one was drawn um, 
who was over 59. So in the initial sex study, the study stopped there, and so there were lots of questions about why we presume that there is an individual was selected. Now, as I say that, we can see <laughs> that things fall off remarkably. Um, and for uh, a $14 million study, others have asked, well, I think we already knew this. Um, but one of the things that's really remarkable about this study is that it's collecting data on sexual activity, on social network interaction, um, but also on a host of other factors about the context of older adults' lives. And, and one of the things that's also um, really amazing about this data set is that it has this wonderful social survey data coupled with a huge array of biomarkers and biomeasures. And so I'll be drawing on those today when I look at CRP. So with that, um, I'm going to draw social disorganization theory to the self, and again, it's this idea of this continuum of disorder. And with that, I'll review some theories on personal disorganization. Uh, this is theory linked to, really, the evolution of social control theory and sociology. There hasn't been a lot written in this work, um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And then I'm going to describe some recent work in the social context. I'll then examine the social and physical disorder as they relate to health, and again, I'm going to use CRP this time as my sample. And I want to look at this nested structure of disorder, so I want to look at what I'm describing as personal disorder, household disorder, and then neighborhood disorder. And then, um, two, I, I'd like to discuss with you really what are the methodological implications of finding such a disease. Um, can interviewers engage in something like a systematic social observation? Um, I know in, in many data sets, including the HRS, we ask interviewers assess sometimes the household, um, sometimes the block area around where the, uh, where the interview took place. Um, I haven't seen as often physical reports of the respondent. So what does the respondent look like? Does he or she look well kept? Um, does she have a two <laughs> That surely would have provoked a joke from Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I was saying, I was actually saying this earlier that I, I'm, I'm not sure you did, but one of the things that was interesting too about this data set is that I, I think um, investigators wanted to know whether people were trying to mm -hmm. my assessment of it, were they trying to look attractive? So they asked about things like whether or not it looked like people had false teeth, gold teeth, uh, a toupee, a dye job, um, were there any other kinds of obvious nose job, anything like that that could indicate that somebody was uh, trying to alter their appearance. So that's I'm not going to focus on that today, but it, but it is an, and it's something that's quite interesting when you think about this data set. Okay, disorder and fear. So um, I'm focusing on this notion of physical and social disorder. Um, this has been some recent work by Philip Clark thinking about uh, markers of the observable environment. It's typically how we think about physical and social disorder. We think about things um, like broken sidewalks, poor lighting, um, you know, things that make it more difficult to traverse. Um, and in some recent literature, um, in the, uh, there was a really nice symposium in the British Journal of Sociology focusing on Rob Sampson's work related to collective efficacy <coughs> theory and uh, the idea of social and physical disorder. Uh, some of his work with Steve Broadbush on perceived disorder and what that means in the context of of our studies of neighborhood context is your disorder the same as my disorder, and really this idea of, of trying to get at physical flags of disorder apart from perceptions of disorder. It might be perceptions that, that drive activity. Uh, Rob points out that, that measures like graffiti, for instance, are something that might pick up both components of social and personal disorder. Um, I then wanted to draw out some literature, and I'd be interested if any of you in the room have, have looked at this literature at all. It's um, Personal disorganization is the way it's been described by Cavill in 1928, Ferris in 1948. Um, I haven't seen a lot of activity since the late 40s in this literature. <coughs> One colleague suggested that there might be a good reason for that. Um, but, I, but I'm still really interested in this idea of the link between what might be seen as personal disorganization and um, household or neighborhood disorganization. And so I've tried to go back to ideas related to self control theory. And the idea that there might be something about the social environment that um, impacts a person's level of social control. Um, and I, as I mentioned earlier, too, I'm interested in this bifurcation of the individual level and the neighborhood level, ideas that might be more fluid, and that um, this notion of disorder, disorder might emerge across a range of environments. So 
pull out the white paper they want. So, and then I think the same, you know, so is it, are you talking about what people look like or whether they're disorganized and they're functioning? Yeah, so, so the theory really touches on both. The way that I'm operationalizing it here will be the way that people appear. And in large part, I think, well, there are two reasons for that one. I mean, one is, it, one relates to the data, but setting that aside for a second, there is something about the way that, that one presents oneself. And it's this idea that that might be influenced more by the larger social environment and the relationship of norms to physical appearance. And also this idea, the other thing I really want to get to is this idea that people might be internalizing fear and that it may express itself through the extent to which they engage in self-care. But now, but I think that's a good Yeah, and, and, uh, and related to this, you know, and extending it to this idea of fear as a response to disorder, um, Mark McClintock, who is a co-investigator on this project, has, has spent a considerable amount of time talking about this idea of hypervigilance, that people who live in low-income neighborhoods are sort of at this kind of ready um, state of, of observance, and so that is difficult for one's system to handle, and, and it might express itself over time in higher degrees of inflammation, that's where CRP comes in, in higher levels of cortisol. What she's examined is breast cancer rates on the south side of Chicago and has found um, that they are much higher and the cancer is much more aggressive given what she attributes to this idea of, or she attributes that to this idea of hypervigilance and the notion that people um, are stressed about life circumstances and she is looking to commit a crime. There's also just uh, some, a very broad literature on the stress response um, and its relationship to social context and disorder for sidewalks and Janet and also then the human semen in their research analysis. <laughs> okay, so I want to try to link this sort of disorder to fear and then fear and, and putting it in the context of older adult well-being. Um, there's an extensive literature on how older adults react to and internalize fear, Ken Ferraro, um, published a number of papers and book on this topic, um, Tuckman and, and your colleague Neil Krauss. The role that social disorder plays in the extent to which older adults feel connected to the community. And it's particularly focused on the role that the church can play in drawing the people out in the context of those social resources. Um, as I was uh, saying earlier, it's, it's also possible that this idea of fear could be reflected in appearance, um, and we can think of personal disorder as a response, and that poor hygiene in particular might act as another manifestation of fear. Um, so coupled with this is the idea that as we age, we may withdraw. Um, within the criminology literature, people sometimes talk about the circumference of the term as it relates to older adults, um, and this idea of a limited, limited radius of daily activity. Uh, in some work with Chris Browning, we looked at who lived and died during the 1995 Chicago heat wave, and found that levels of disorder coupled with the extent to which there were, were uh, active commerce in the communities in which people lived had uh, an important effect on mortality rates. Um, so it's really this idea that, that older adults may, indeed because their circum circumference of turf is smaller, they may internalize their surroundings more readily, um, and then indeed you may actually begin to embody this disorder, that there's spillover into the personal, essentially. Um, so, yeah. psychological explanation in terms of people feeling fear for whatever self-generated reasons. But are you planning to look at things such as limitations of activity and such and, and those kinds of things? I mean, maybe people 
their false teeth, not because they care about how they look, but because their teeth came out and they want to be able to eat. That's right. Yeah. Uh, if, if, and if they have trouble walking stairs, then mm-hmm. are you going to be looking at these physical I, things? I do. Yeah. I, I will control for that, and then actually, um, at the end, I'm, I'm drawing out the the relationship between physical activity and negative context. Um, so I so I'll be showing that in the in the results piece, but maybe you can help uh, talk through that a little bit more. But yeah, I think it's a great point that the extent to which in society too that this this one of the reasons.
much of the neighborhood context <coughs> measures are in the leave behind questionnaire. Um, and then, but separate from that are these assessments by the interviewers that are completed at the end of this entire process. Um, wave one field period was June 2005 to March 2006. Wave two is um, the pretest has just been completed. We just looked at these data, uh, and our field period commenced to begin in June. So, uh, should you have any ideas about things we might modify for this instrument? I want to be thinking, and then in relation to number two, most proximal, am I thinking that that means that you're thinking about personal household and neighborhood disorder as all measuring the same thing, but that personal disorder has less measurement error as a measure of the disorder that the person experiences or perceives? I don't think that they're measuring the same thing, but I was thinking that I would probably see a larger impact with the personal as opposed to the household. I think because it would be sort of the, the thing that most closely connected to how somebody reacts in moments of stress. And that's what I'm hypothesizing. I'm not certain that's true. But I'm thinking that it is. It's sort of, um, I mean, one could think about it as biologically proximal, I suppose. Um, and that it might be the first sign. I mean, one way to walk through it potentially is we think about what, you know, how do we react when we're nervous? Well, we might sweat, right? We might, our blood pressure might go up, our cortisol levels are going to spike, and that this might then um, have a direct effect on our appearance for the extent to which we're that. Yeah. Wait, but isn't the causation in the neighborhood thing going the opposite direction? Like it's really stressful to me that I live in this crumbling environment. So say, say more about. Um, <clears throat> okay, so like there's these three levels at which things can be disordered. Mm -hmm. I can look like a mess, my house can look like a mess, I don't want to know a lot about the sampling, but can you tell whether you have seven people that live in the same neighborhood, or what, what are you able to compare that I'm neat and uh, John's not, <laughs> and we live in the same neighborhood, so at that point, that's more of a personal mm -hmm. difference between us. Um, right. Uh, 
Um, so what, what can you tell? Yeah, I, I can, I do know who's, <coughs> right now I know who is in the same PSU. Um, we are in the process of geocoding all of these data, and so I'll be able to have a better response in terms of actually knowing what track people are in in about six weeks. Do you also have several people from the same household? Um, no. What we have in wave one is uh, we just have the local respondents, and we were just funded now through wave two to um, draw on the partner if that older adult actually has a, has a partner. And we interviewed that to individual. Some of those partners will be within the same household. So but you're separating of the individual from the neighborhood is a little different than your separation of the individual from the household. In a sense. Confusion might be like yeah, for the household and neighborhood uh, measures you're, you're going to pull from this order. Were they based on the response reports or are they based on the? They're the only based. All of it's based. I'm just thank you. All of it's yeah. based on interview reports. Okay. So it doesn't. So the, the, at that level, it, oh. the, the level of clustering within the household or the neighborhood doesn't really matter if you're <coughs> if you're not basing it on aggregations of respondents. If the, the measures you're, you're basing on, you know, an outsider's rating. That's right. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. Although I was interested in looking at some of those kinds of effects mm -hmm. in the aggregate level, and because I have data by PSU, I could actually do that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we've already really uh, talked about the general design. <coughs> um, the sampling frame and overview, actually, the sampling frame comes from the HRS. Uh, the HRS target population and check zone overlap. These were surplus households that were generated by HRS. Um, and only see provided. Uh, the approach allows over sampling of African Americans and Hispanics. Um, we have an incredibly high response rate, um, over 75%, and you, that you will find almost more, I would imagine, more remarkable enrollment when, when I talk about things like national swab. Um, so it was amazing that we were able to get that kind of um, response rate when we're actually drawing blood and asking for pretty invasive uh, tests. Um, Sociographic demographic characteristics, the average age of baseline was um, 67, 41% uh, women, 40, almost 42%, um, about 84% of that was white, and 59 had some college or higher education. What? Just going to be more women than men. That was me. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Should there be more, more women than men? Really big. Were there more women than men? Yeah. Shouldn't there be? And there. Yeah. I, oh, I think you just switched. Yeah. It said 40, yeah, yeah, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. So it was There's a typo on the slide. Oh, there's a typo. Okay. Yeah, okay. sorry, that's all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you, like, vastly oversampled men so that when they die, you'll still have enough of them yeah. Yeah. Okay. at older ages. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so wave one is in a series of modules. Uh, module A was support for family and friends, component on elderly treatment. Uh, non-sexual contact, Module 2, uh, children and grandchildren, sexual interests, healthcare utilization, STDs, ideas about medical decision making, Module C has a blood spot, Module D, HIV testing, Module E, get up and go, uh, touch and vision. What's get up and go? Get up and go is when you're sitting in a chair and then you're asked to get up and go, <laughs> and then you are time. So it's both getting at the, um, the extent to which you can push yourself up and then it's kind of combining that and the idea of walking around the small room, which has been a, a historically a measure that we use for disability assessment. Uh, so I'm going to talk about biomeasures and biomarkers. Uh, biomarker is the biological or biologically derived <coughs> indicator process, event, or condition, such as aging or disease, uh, cholesterol is an assay derived from blood, uh, CRP is a biomarker. Biomeasure is a term adopted by a <coughs> research group um, to more accurately reflect a broader construct of biological indices applicable to survey research. Um, this term encompasses only markers, but rather, not only that, but rather a broad range of biological, functional, sensory measures that can be collected by this uh, and from these survey respondents. Uh, I just wanted to show you this, but you may all be familiar with the way that um, something like CRP is collected. 
person, these are blood spots um, that are placed on a card. Um, we are able to get C reactive protein, Epstein Barr, and hemoglobin A1C this way. Uh, this method was developed uh, primarily in the survey research community by Thomas David at Northwestern. Um, and uh, biomeasure response rates. I, this I, I share with you to show you the list of biomeasures, but also <coughs> um, want to show you the response rates in the blood spots. Uh, height, weight, blood pressure, touch, smell, waist circumference, distance, vision, pace, get up and go, saliva, HIV tests, uh, these blood spots and the vaginal swab. Um, our blood spot response rates uh, was 85%. Uh, so the dependent measure, why are we looking at CRP? It's a biomarker of immune function, a biomarker of disease or risk, Often considered a precursor to cardiovascular disease and inflammation. <coughs> yeah. I'm assuming those items in non response or out of the people who agreed to respond in the 70% or whatever you had before with the people who agreed to respond at all. Is that correct? I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. you. I'm assuming that the response rates that you reported in the previous slide are item non response. And the, you reported an overall response rate before, which I assume was whether the people agreed at all to participate. That's right. And so in fact, again, it's kind of... I should adjust it. You're right. Yeah. Well, I'm just, it was clarification. No, that's absolutely right. Did um, people know ahead of time when they agreed that they would be asked to do all of these things? When they agreed to the survey? Yes. Yes, they did. Yeah, which is very long, um, required by our IRB that people have knowledge of all the different kinds of tests they'll be asked to. Well, you could imagine, though, for example, that you would have a survey where you, it looked like that because of the high response rates, but you could imagine a survey <coughs> where you did the survey and then you asked as a separate element whether they would be willing to do, to have blood taken, and you wouldn't necessarily want to actually tell them ahead of time that you were going to do the blood. And then you'd have, then you'd have another provision that they did. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, anyway, it's, it's, so it's a design feature. It's not, I don't think there's one way to do it. Other than you have, I would assume IOB would allow either, but you have, would have to be careful about what you did. They yeah. don't stop HRS <coughs> from going out and actually <coughs> collecting data as long as they get IOB approval for doing that because we didn't ask them in 1992 whether we could do mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of how HRS handles the, the blood draws. Um, but yeah, our, all, of our, um, all of our permissions are handled up front. So yeah, they could be, uh, there are instances where people broke the interview, but at the front end, we were aware of all of the components of the measures. Um, yeah, also one of the other reasons I'm, I'm interested in CRP is it's an indicator of preclinical disability. This is actually some early work by Linda Freed, um, who is now at Columbia, who was looking at this idea of the iceberg of disability and that we were really getting only at the tip where we were looking at things like we extend to which people um, <coughs> fell or um, showed some other kind of obvious uh, disabled state. And so this is an idea that if we can get at something before people are necessarily physically aware of their functioning is in some way in condition um, So I'm looking at the high-risk group who are not currently ill, um, and that is a CRP value between 2.5 and 8.6. This is a, a essentially a, an agreed upon standard um, from some work from Tom McDade, but others who have looked at um, what is the level of CRP that indicates inflammation but doesn't indicate acute illness. Yeah. So you, if I'm not currently ill, that you just mean acute illness, you don't mean not having any chronic condition. So I mean based only on the on the CRP value. So there were 136 people who had incredibly high levels of CRP, and those persons are not analyzing here. But you say not currently <coughs> ill, I'm not, I'm just asking like how you define I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, Ill. yeah, I just meant um, broadly that they didn't have acute illness. Um, it was this 
I gave an interview already to capture two salient elements of the last respondent's appearance, so their physique, um, and we're thinking about posture, stomach, thinness, and the respondent's personal care habits, being well-dressed or hygienic. Also, these measures on household level that, um, you know, are both trying to look at these levels of disorder, but also if there was a smell in the house, and it was believed that that could affect the olfactory screening, so we wanted to be able to control for that when we're looking at those assessments. And then uh, neighborhood, again, is assessing the condition of the surrounding buildings um, and the condition of the respondent's building relative to other buildings in the neighborhood. And it, that these are signs of disorder. Um, I'm gonna look, use a fixed effects uh, logic because I'm interested in that clustering by interviewer. Um, and then I'm just this very simple analysis, as I said, this is the first run through this data, looking at individual and then these interview-based assessments on the first home health in the neighborhood. Um, I just wanna show you uh, these are the descriptive statistics in my sample. Um, average age is about 69, primarily um, white. Uh, about 23% had less than high school education. 59% uh, are urban. Average years in the neighborhood, about 23. Um, just over 60% are, um, are married in this sample, and those will be the people who in wave two will draw on the, that partner assessment. Um, mean BMI is 29, um, about 20% have two or, or more ADLs, um, and about 25% uh, report feeling isolated at some point, and a mean number, mean level of alters uh, about three. And the reason I'm drawing on these, again, is that some of this came up in conversation earlier, is to get at this idea of, of whether or not people feel socially isolated, and that might have some effect on the uh, personal um, I'm going to look at, we're going to look at about four or five descriptive um, assessments of these data, and then um, I'm going to show you two tables. So uh, this is interview rate descriptions of the respondent. Um, when they were physically attractive, do they have an attractive personality? Are they well-dressed, hygienic, straight posture, flat stomach versus a pot belly, uh, thin versus obese, and whether they spoke clearly or did not speak clearly? Um, as you can see, there are, there are essentially scales in these. The one that I'm, I'm most interested in focusing upon is hygienic. Um, and I, I cut that variable at, um, at three. I'm actually not, in, I'd be interested to see what you think. I, I don't know scientifically whether I'm really interested in the flat stomach versus pot belly. Um, and the attractive personality is being <laughs> incorporated into the physical attractive. Um, and I, I, I did, right now, as I said, I, I thought that the uh, hygiene piece was closest to how it was conceptualizing it, but I'm interested in whether or not these scales are so they're trying to develop a larger scale for this. Um, but right now, I'm thinking hygiene. Um, how, are so these, how are these standardized in terms of getting the interviewers to have sort of comparable measures yeah. across, across the interviewers? You mean in terms of training? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, one person <coughs> physically attractive may not be another. Actually, one thing we have spent a lot of time on is to look at the extent to which we see differences by age, race, and gender in terms of the evaluations of, of the respondents, the household, and the neighborhood. And it looks like the only thing that we've been able to see so far is that there seems to be an age effect in the extent to which um, interviewers assess disorder <coughs> in the household. So it seems that younger <coughs> interviewers think there's more disorder. <coughs> And that's the only effect that we've seen right now. <laughs> Did I miss? You, you were against Charlie Pryor. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking if my mom was an interviewer, you know, you'd have fives just stacked up one on top of another. <laughs> <laughs> she was always trying, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there also were run through, you know, a, a number. I, to me, it gave me actually some faith in the extent to which the, <coughs> the interviewers were trained effectively. Jeff, did that help? Are you going to show us the interview instructions for the hygiene measure? I'm not going to show you that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm trying to remember the exact language. I don't have it here, but um, it was essentially to assess, you know, whether or not somebody, um, did they smell, did they look you know, like they hadn't showered. There's some language like that in the in the prompt. But I, I can pull that back. That would be good to share. I guess I was just thinking about Ryan's question. Like, actually, what you're not, I think what
we're less concerned about whether or not there are these predictable correlates of rating as to whether they're interview interviewer specific individual effects. Right. right. And so that's empirically what you want to demonstrate to make me feel you know confident that Charlie's mom was not an interviewer, for example. <laughs> right. But there's kind of another element here which is um, which interviewers go to which area yeah. and what type of people like how Absolutely. the yeah. you know, presumably they went randomized, they were you know systematically Right, designed. right, and that's where we were interested in you know, because we think there's some general overlap between where the interviewer goes and the PSU. And it's one reason why I was using fixed effects to try to get at that. But we've been doing other kinds of things to try to ascertain whether or not there are differences. But right now um, Aaron York Cornwell, who's done a lot of work on the household disorder piece, um, spent a, a large, um, well, one appendix in her dissertation was devoted to just this question about how effective interviewers were, at least in assessing the household measures. So Jeff, you were going to say something? I was going to say basically the same thing that Ryan said, but I, I guess what I'd be looking to know is well, how many interviewers were there total, and were they assigned, like, if, if, if region or urbanicity, for example, is confounded with these impressions of both the person, the household, and the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Is there, are you actually getting enough overlap between the types of context that, that interviewers are being sent into um, to, 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 to let us be sure that these fixed effects are really picking up, um, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. people rate, that are rating multiple different types of context. So how many interviewers were there total at home? about the subjective issues of the evaluation, but I'm also wondering whether you could either include or if there already are objective measures. And when you've been telling this story, I've been really struggling with the hygiene stuff because I mm -hmm. feel like, okay, the analytical model that I see here is, you know, I mean, you could say that the neighborhood is messy, but I think of it more as how hard it might be to navigate the neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. And how exhausting it is and how hard it might be to maintain your household. So I feel like that it's not hygiene, but at least for me, it's time and like my ability to control my own time, right? And if my environment is hard, I have less energy, I'm less able to control myself, that's gonna come out in hygiene, but it's gonna come out in like my ability to exercise and mm -hmm. do all kinds of other things. And I'm wondering whether you have any measures of people's ability to order their own time, or if that's something that you're interested in, because I feel like it would get around all of these subjective measures and it also might be more proximate to the health. So, I mean, obviously hygiene is proximate to health, but it gets at sort of a broader set of things that might be related to health. I don't have any data that looks like that. Yet, uh, but one could think about using some of the measures related to, um, I've suffered a physical health, I have ADLs, which to some degree I would imagine would be correlated with what you're describing, um, potentially. But I don't have anything that looks at people's routine, your ability to make Here, 
so we can see that there looks like there might be visually some purchase there. But again, this is just sort of familiar mm -hmm. question. Um, and respondents neighborhood and hygiene. So this is the um, uh, rec by how well kept are other buildings on street. Uh, fairly well kept. Very well kept. Um, up to four lanes. You can see there's some distributional changes there. Um, okay, and this is CRP and respondent home and neighborhood. So this is at NCRP level where I was interested in people who are high risk. Um, we have come very very well. And you can see there might be some sort of slight movement here. How we'll capture other buildings on the street. You can see a little more action from very poor to very well. Um, and again, higher for CRP is worse. Um, okay, I'm going to show you two tables. These are fixed effect uh, budget models and elevated CRP. I'm showing these here mostly descriptively. Because I'm not going to draw out the uh, gender or race effects, but we see that both African American race and female gender are associated with elevated CRP. Number of alters appears to be protective. Um, smoking, this is consistent with uh, other literature that looks at the relationship between health behaviors and CRP. Um, number of ADLs, again, is associated with higher CRP. And I know I mentioned earlier BMI, um, and BMI actually is one of the uh, strongest predictors of elevated CRP. Okay, and then here are a series of models. Um, this is, these are fixed effect logits, um, again, with elevated CRP. We have that um, model that we just saw in the last slide, um, but I wanted to focus on the alters and isolation, the number of ADLs, and we see the synthesis and effect of BMI. And then I am um, looking at that the measure of personal disorder. Again, I was using um, the hygiene measure specifically. Uh, household disorder is a scale with the questions that we saw earlier on um, whether or not here, I'm just going to Household and neighborhood disorder, the effect of personal disorder goes up, I mean, marginally, to be sure, but goes up. <coughs> and that suggests that, that personal disorder is negatively correlated with these other kinds of disorders somehow? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that, that <laughs> I was surprised by too. <coughs>
don't have any ADLs at all, um, about 65% um, where our mean is too, um, or I mean not mean it, but of, the, of those who do have some form of ADL, the mean is too. So we're seeing some kind of effect um, between the number of, uh, between neighborhood disorder and the number of ADLs. Um, so that was just really to show you graphically the interaction term, which I think mobility may limit exposure to the neighborhood and this gets at your point again about BMI and another question that was raised earlier about the extent to which people are able to function in the neighborhood. Um, and this is actually a, a suggestion made by uh, David Melcher who's a clinician at the UFC who was looking at some of these results and, and suggested that the hygiene effect may actually be due to associated health behaviors. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with real health, the idea that flossing is 